morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> awesome. So my name is Melanie Ung, and I'm a first-year master's student, supervised by William Chung as part of the Changing Oceans Research Unit. My work is also funded by Too Big to Ignore Global Partnership for Small-Scale Fisheries Research. I'm going to use the next few minutes of my presentation to tell you a little bit about some of my interests and ideas leading to this point, my two research questions, and I would welcome any feedback and suggestions moving forward. As I'm still in the beginning stages of my research, um, I'm just going to be really brief and it's just going to be an introduction. So there are three components topics to my research, and those are small-scale fisheries, climate change, and adaptability. I'm going to go into each of these areas in a bit more detail and explain what exactly within them I'm interested in researching. The first is small-scale fisheries. What are small-scale fisheries? Most of you probably already know, but there's no global definition. That is, what is considered small-scale in one country could easily be large-scale in another. This is a very complex topic in itself, but for the purposes of my presentation, I'm going to be using what each country defines a small scale, if that is provided. The next question is, why even study small scale fisheries? For those who attended Anna's talk last week as well as yesterday, you've heard this already before, and I'm going to say it again, the majority of the world's fisheries are small scale. When I say majority, I mean up to 90% of global fisheries employment are deemed to be from the small-scale sectors. As well, about one-third of all global fisheries catch are from the small-scale sector. In addition to both the high number of fishers involved and the levels of production, I am personally interested in studying small-scale fisheries because of the socio-cultural importance. They are crucial to the livelihoods, food security, and cultural identity of many coastal communities. However, despite this importance, we find that they are often marginalized politically, economically, because they can exist in geographically isolated regions. This is my study region, encompassing the United States, Canada, and Mexico. I've selected this case study region for three different reasons. The first, because this is an area that's close to home for me, for us living here in Vancouver. The second reason is because fisheries along this coast are highly diverse, both in terms of fishing vessels, they vary in size, engine type, but also the communities are vastly different in terms of their values, their social structures, and uh, their economic statuses. I'm interested, oh, and finally the third reason I'm interested in studying this area is because of projected climate change effects along a longitudinal range. Which brings me to my next topic of interest, climate change. Now in a community of marine fishes and invertebrates, different species have different thermal preferences and tolerances, such that they can only live in an ocean condition that suits this thermal preference, as indicated by the circle. As ocean temperature warms up, these ocean conditions may be too warm for some species, leading to their local extinction. Other species may need to move towards higher latitudes or deeper waters in order to stay within this thermal preference. This is termed climate shifted distribution and is modeled by the Dynamic Bioclimate Envelope Model, or DBEM. This model projects the change in species distribution across space and time under climate change scenarios. This model takes into account other projected changes in ocean conditions, salinity, oxygen content, as well as carrying capacity, population size, and other variables that I'm still in the process of trying to understand. If we take a step back and zoom out, this is what it looks like on a regional scale. The figure here on your left shows the temperate oceans, and we expect an increase in species as they move to keep within their thermal preference. And on your right-hand side, the tropics, we expect increased species extinction and hence less species over time. Now this is a figure adapted from the IPCC, or Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which essentially shows 
How does fisheries catches change over time? This is modeled under RCP, or Representative Concentration Pathway 8.5, which indicates a high emission or business as usual uh, scenario. There's also a 2.6, which is a lower emission scenario, which I'll be also uh, incorporating my research a little bit on this on the next slide. If I can direct your attention now to the Pacific North America region, you'll see that in the higher latitudes, there's a blue color indicating an increase in catch potential, the winners of climate change, while the southern United States and Mexico region, a yellow or orange indicating a decrease in catch potential. It's important to note that this figure represents all types of fisheries, large scale and small scale. Now, what I'm interested in finding out is how much of this change in catch potential is attributed to just the small scale fisheries. To do this, I will be integrating small scale fisheries catches from the sea around us with species distribution data from the DBEM under the two climate change scenarios that I've outlined earlier to give me the change in catch amount and composition to 2050. I hope that this will be able to answer my first research question, which is, will climate change impact small-scale fisheries? And if so, are there any gradients or trends of this, uh, of this changes across this region? Once I know this, the next question I I'm curious about is which small-scale fisheries will best be able to cope with these disturbances? That is, are there characteristics of some small-scale fisheries that enable them to be more successful or better adapted than others? I'm talking here about the adaptability. And IPCC defines adaptability as the ability of the system to cope with disturbances to take advantage of new opportunities, or to cope and adjust to climate change. Historically, common ways that small-scale fisheries cope with disturbances are by changing target species, so to catch what is now newly available within your fishing area, or to shift fishing grounds, so to travel farther in order to catch what you're historically used to fishing. The diversity of fishing gear, hence, the diversity of your catch portfolio, can be used as a measure of your ability to change target species. While fishing costs, taking into account fuel, effort-related costs, among other things, can be used as an indicator of your ability to shift fishing grounds. Ultimately, the question I want to answer is, how does fishing gear, gear diversity, and cost intensity affect the adaptability of small-scale fisheries. This is still in the beginning stages, uh, and I'm reading a lot of papers from a lot of people in this room, uh, but I'll tell you what I envision for this chapter, which is I want to select a few case study fisheries and employ a bioeconomic approach. I want to calculate the future profitably potential of a fishery, taking into account both the biology the species distribution, the catch potential, as well as the economics. How much will the price of fish be worth in the future, the landings? And I want to link this with the adaptability indicators, the adaptability measures that I mentioned earlier. Oh, finally, <laughs> I want to conclude by saying uh, that I'll be working with small-scale fishing communities through the Too Big to Ignore network both to add sociocultural context to my research, but also I hope that my research will be able to add to the understanding of small-scale fisheries adaptability uh, and add to the resilience in these communities. Thank you very much.